Hello and welcome. In today's video, we will talk about informed patient consent. The talk will address the following questions. What is the need for consent in patient care? What are the different types of consent? What is the requirement for taking consent? How do we take consent in children? How do we take consent when the patient is unconscious? What about mental health patients? What is the position of consent in such conditions? In addition to the above, there are certain special situations where consent is required and may be difficult. Lastly, we will discuss how do you document for informed consent and what counseling will you do before or during informed consent? So, first of all, let us answer the question, what is the need for consent in patient care? All medical professional bodies agree and support the practice of the consent process by healthcare providers. For the doctor, it serves as a legal document that is defendable in court and which confirms the physician is undertaking professional and legal responsibility for the patient. Consent is a fundamental human right and an ethical and moral requirement for patients undergoing a procedure or an admission to a healthcare facility. Consent to treatment means permitting a medical person to take a history, to do a physical examination, to conduct investigations and to perform procedures. The procedure can be as minor as inserting a progesterone implant for family planning or it can be as complex as a major surgical procedure. For consent to be valid, it must be voluntary and informed and the person consenting must have the capacity to decide. What are the different types of consent? Consent may be verbal. For example, a patient may be willing to have ultrasound examination or if a patient needs a blood test and nurse comes near the patient, then the patient will hold out her arm and roll up her sleeve it is implicit that she is consenting to the procedure. However, written consent is taken by physicians and, and nurses in patients who are being admitted to the hospital and who will probably have a procedure. The requirements for taking consent include the patient who is giving consent must have the mental capacity to understand what is being told to the person and should be able to respond by asking questions and also by agreeing. The consent must be given freely and voluntarily. It should be sufficiently specific to the procedure or the treatment being proposed and it should be well informed. The meaning of these terms is that by pressure we mean the medical staff, friends or family should not influence or pressurize the person giving consent. It has to be given freely and voluntarily. By informed we mean that all the information should be provided about the treatment including the risks and benefits whether there are any reasonable alternative treatments and what will happen if the treatment does not go ahead. By capacity we mean the person must be able to understand and respond. If a patient is under the influence of drugs, for example, a patient has been given a pre-operative medazolam injection and has been transferred to theatre. 
and in the theater the patient is asked to sign a consent form then this consent form will not be valid under law so we have to be very careful when we take consent that we do so when the patient is not under influence of drugs is awake and is fully conscious what about consent from children in every country the law decides what will be the age of the child after which consent can be given by the child in cases where the child is not at that age the consent is given by the guardian or by the parent the guardian has to be a legal guardian not just somebody who is accompanying the patient in pakistan the national legislation commends the age of consent as above 18 years the pakistan penal code child abuse amendment act article 377a has defined these markers as well there may be some exceptions for example the healthcare provider can go ahead if a child needs emergency treatment to save the child's life similarly if a procedure is being performed and during the procedure there is a complication or some other new finding which has to be dealt with doctors should be very careful when they are taking consent for children and documentation should be absolutely complete and implicit another area of consent is in unconscious patients some patients are being kept alive with supportive treatments such as lung ventilation these patients have never made any decisions while they were awake about the care that should be provided to them when they are unconscious in such cases decisions about continuing or stopping treatment has to be made very carefully where relatives and friends are available the doctors can discuss with them the details of the treatment process and ask for consent sometimes a patient may not be able to give consent and may not be accompanied by any relatives or friends such a situation may arise if a patient is brought in after an accident or in a critical state due to some complication example diabetic ketoacidosis or a heart attack in such cases the doctor has to make a decision regarding the treatment which is has to be provided the patient's best interest will also include considering whether it is safe to wait until the person gives consent if a doctor is making some decisions about a patient's uh, care which involves religious beliefs or moral beliefs and if the doctor knows about this then these should be kept in mind during the treatment process in rare situations where a person is felt to lack capacity and there are no family and friends or the family and friends are not able to make the decision then help can be sought from a court of law for permission or to get an advanced decision through power of attorney there are some special situations apart from the those above in which patients may have certain personal beliefs for example refusing a blood transfusion in a special situation because it is against their religious belief or receiving an uh, intramuscular injection or an intravenous drip while fasting in ramadan in such cases the patient should understand the reality of the situation 
and the consequences if the treatment is withheld. A very special situation where consent is difficult is those patients who have reduced mental capacity due to mental health illnesses such as schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or dementia. In such cases, the doctor has to refer to the Mental Health Ordinance 2001, a presidential order and after the 18th Amendment of the Constitution, Sindh Punjab and Khaybar Pakhtunkhwa made laws referring to the Mental Health Ordinance 2001. Apart from mental health diseases and disorders, there are certain other situations where there may be reduced mental capacity. For example, severe learning disorders or brain damage secondary to stroke or brain injury or physical and mental conditions in which there is confusion or loss of consciousness or the patient has been given drugs such as midazolam or the patient is using certain recreational drugs and is under the influence of these drugs or if the patient is misusing alcohol. Now we move towards a very important part of our talk which involves documentation. It is important that documentation is being done on a, on a form or on a structured form which has been developed by an institution and which has got inclusion of items which are of legal importance. The institution can get legal assistance and formulate a consent form to protect the patients as well as the doctors and the nurses. There are two important aspects of this consent form and the consent process. Firstly, counseling of the patient about the details of the procedure is imperative. And secondly, taking the patient through the consent form and getting the signature is important. The counseling process can either be done separately from the consent form or it can be done as the consent form is being completed. The documentation should always be on the letterhead of the institution in which you are working. It should have a date and it should have um, uh, a timing, a time at which the consent is being taken. It should also have some recognition of the page number or of the section in which this consent is going to be filed. The documentation should include the name of the patient as well as some identification that can be accepted in the court of law. Date of birth can also be mentioned here to ensure that a specific patient is being referred to. The name identification of the principal doctor responsible for the procedure or the treatment should be written down. The name of the procedure, the date on which the procedure will be performed, make sure no abbreviations are being used. What are the complications? Enumerate the complications. If there is no space to write down the complications, then you can write them down by hand. In case the operation is changed because of a complication or if there is an unexpected finding, this consent form allows the doctor to make adjustments to this procedure. The consent form also involves consent for having anesthesia, medications, intravenous fluids and even blood transfusion. Once the consent form has been completed and the, and the, uh, the, the counselling has been done and the patient is satisfied, then the patient has to make a signature to confirm this. And the signature should also contain the patient's name as well as identification number. This form is also signed by the surgeon 
or the doctor with the name and signature and designation. The names of the witnesses, their designation and signature with dates. In addition, if any interpreters are used, then the names of the interpreter, their designation and signature with dates. Let's talk a little bit about witnesses. There should be two witnesses to the consent process apart from the surgeon. And these are usually nurses or doctors in training. Medical students cannot be witnesses. A patient's relative can be a witness, but they must be present throughout the counseling process. They must hear the doctor discussing the risks benefits and alternatives with the patient remember in a court of law the consent will be taken in favor of the patient interpretation of the consent and against the interpretation of the doctor or the hospital so it is in the doctor's interest that the more detailed the explanation, the more it will favor the doctor. Similarly, if you are using an interpreter to counsel the patient, then the interpreter should have some standing within the institution in which you are seeing the patient. You cannot just pick up an interpreter from the road or from the waiting area and use them. The person has to have some designation, some uh, either they are officially interpreters or they are working in the hospital and they belong to a certain ethnic group in which they are familiar with the language. We next move on to the counseling process. The doctor who is performing the procedure has to ensure that the patient and a close family member are counseled for the procedure. Counseling includes informing about the name of the procedure, what is going to be done during the procedure, what if something untoward happens during the procedure, what complications can happen, how will the complications be dealt with, how will the procedure help the patient, how long will the patient take to recover and what will be the post-operative care of the patient? The patient and the family may want some information about the cost of the procedure and the cost of the hospitalization. For this, you have to refer the patient to the concerned person or department. With this, we come to the end of the video. Do not forget to subscribe and share the video with your friends. Thanks and goodbye.